Welcome to Parenting Decoded, a podcast for practical approaches to parenting. I'm Mary Eschen. This is a special podcast recording of a seminar I did on Zoom for parents who are struggling with kids who don't seem to listen to them no matter how much they nag or yell. I also have a YouTube version of this that includes all my PowerPoint slides that you can find on my Parenting Decoded YouTube channel. Whether you prefer podcasts or YouTube, I want to get you as much help as I possibly can in supporting you in your quest to be an amazing parent. If you have questions, please contact me at mary at parentingdecoded.com. Enjoy the podcast in the meantime. Welcome to my seminar on how to get your kids to listen. I am so happy to have you here tonight with me. I am going to hopefully give you some great ideas about how to get those kids of yours to listen. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go into a shared screen mode so that I can show you my PowerPoint presentation. Well, what we want to do is we want to figure out how first we talk to kids currently. One of the things about getting our kids to listen is that we need to know how we're talking to them right now. We also, I'm going to cover what it is that we might be communicating with our kids to our kids when we are talking to them. And then I want to talk about when might be the best time to talk to our kids, to get them to listen and for us to be as effective as possible. After I cover those things, I'm going to talk about some techniques that you guys can use in order to get your kids to listen better. So with that, let's talk first about how we currently talk to our kids. Well, I want to talk about three types of parents. There are helicopter parents, there are drill sergeants, and there are consultant parents. And each one of those has particular ways in which they communicate. The first I'm going to talk about is a helicopter parent. And I think it's a pretty common term, especially in Silicon Valley, which all of you on this in the seminar are all in Silicon Valley. It's like, we helicopter, what do we do? We nag our kids, we hover, we make sure things are great. We're trying to make the world perfect. I know a lot about helicopter parents because I'm a recovering helicopter parent myself. I have two boys. They're in their 20s now. They're out of college and doing well. But my younger son, he loved having a helicopter parent. I could make the world as perfect as I possibly could. And when he was really young, it worked pretty good because kindergartners, first grade, second grade, you have a lot of input into their lives and who they're playing with and stuff like that. But as life kept going on, and I would try to fix things whenever things went wrong, I couldn't always fix everything. And my son was growing up being disappointed every day because life was not perfect. But I was trying to make it perfect. I was lovingly trying to make it perfect. I mean, I'm a really good helicopter parent. I'm a competent person. I was an executive and all this. I was like, if anybody could be a good helicopter, it would be me. But I was not doing my son a service by fixing all of his problems because he was learning to not bother to try to fix problems. He thought it was mom's job. And the thing is, is that when a helicopter is working with their kid, we're giving them the misimpression, one, that life is perfect, which you and I all know that life isn't perfect, right? And the second thing is, is that we're robbing them of the ability for them to think about how to fix their problems. And So as a consequence, they're kind of left being disappointed. And that was exactly what my son was. He was disappointed all the time. So I was really fortunate that when my kids were about middle school, I learned something about love and logic parenting, which is the kind of parenting classes that I teach when I teach classes. And I'm so thankful because I got to step back, stop taking care of all my children's problems, my child's problems, and allow him and come in with empathy and love to um, help him solve problems instead of me solving them for him. So next parent type, a drill sergeant. Now drill sergeants, you know, in the army, we think of the drill sergeant as yelling at people and stuff like that. And that's what a drill sergeant parent does. They yell at their kids. They tell them what to do. They basically are trying to get them to do what they want. Because a drill sergeant has the right idea in mind, because as a drill sergeant, you know what is supposed to be done. You know how to get their backpacks done or their homework done or what, how, when people should wake up or get in the car or whatever. And so when we have resistance, it makes us mad and we start yelling and telling them exactly what to do. 
and there's a very little chance for discussion. We don't want to hear our son or daughter say, but, but mom, I have to do this first or that first or whatever. We don't care. We want them to do what we tell them to do. And we don't really want to hear about it. And the thing is, is that it winds up shutting down the child's opinions. Not to say that our opinions aren't greater somehow, but the thing is, is that in the long term, what happens is if a child is always told what to do, even if you don't happen to be a yelling type parent, drill sergeant, if you're a parent who's always telling your kid, like, do this, do that, and they're obedient kids, we wind up robbing them of being able to think for themselves about what should be done. It's like, back, pack your backpack right now, and they go and do it. Do this right now, brush your teeth now, do this now, instead of saying, could you get ready for bed? and allowing them to know what elements take place when they get ready for bed, but we don't have to manage them and tell them exactly what to do and what order and things like that. Because what happens when we over tell our kids what to do, or we yell at them and tell them what to do, what happens is that our kids learn to not have an opinion. And shutting down opinion, our kids having opinions, winds up kind of making them be followers, or they wind up being lazy because they're going to get told what to do and mom and dad don't really care what their opinion is. So as a consequence, the kid doesn't care. Like it doesn't matter what my opinion is. Mom and dad are going to make me do it anyway. So it's a little bit of a complication, huh? And we don't really want that for our kids, do we? So let's talk about the third type of parent. It's a consultant and a consultant communication type that they use when they're talking to someone would be that they're chatting with them or they're talking to them. And what I want you to do, I want you to think about your best friend, whether it's your spouse or some other best friend that's a coworker or friend for life or whatever. I want you to think about that person. What is it that you like about that person? What is it that makes you want to be with that person? You call them up, you have a Zoom call or whatever with them. Why? A lot of times it's because they accept us. Maybe they're not so judgmental. Or if they are, it might be that they're honest with us. It's somebody that we can tell things to that we'll have a conversation about. It's not somebody who yells at us. It's not someone who tells us what to do. And it's not somebody typically who's trying to solve all our problems and tell us what to do like a helicopter might. So this kind of person, as a parent, is a parent who's not going to lecture about things. They're going to chat with their kids, talk to them. They're going to show respect for their opinions. Even if we don't agree with our kids' opinions, we're going to let them express them. And one of the things that consultant parents do is something that I call seize the moment. And in seizing the moment, those of you who have kids who are in, especially middle and high school, you certainly start seeing it probably in fourth and fifth grades where our kids start withdrawing from us just a little bit. And then by high school and middle school, they want their own time. They don't want you to be by them. They don't, they don't want the spotlight turned on. They'll come home from school and we'll want to say, what's happening? What, what kind of tests do you have this week? What, what, how's your grade? Is your teacher getting along? You know, are you getting along with your friends? We just want to have them do a little bit of a data dump, don't we? We just want to know what they're doing how they're feeling. And our kids, when they get older, they don't want that. They don't want that spotlight. When they're little, when the, those of you who have first and second graders, kindergartners, they want to tell you probably just about everything, don't they? They're so adorable. And they chit chat and they tell you and they probably tell you too much. But as they get older, they're going to close down. And what I want to do is talk about you creating moments that you can seize to be able to chill out with your kids so that they don't think that the spotlight is on them. And the way you do that is you're going to play games with them. One category of things that you could do is play games with them. You could do puzzles. You could play board games, Monopoly or Yahtzee or something like that, or, or Settlers of Catan. You could, you could play video games with them. There's um, a couple of video games where families might actually enjoy playing with each other. You could play card games. With me, my son, the younger son that I told you, I always hel I helicoptered too much. There is a card game called King's Corner. And that card game is a little bit of a cross between solitaire and um, a, it's a multiplayer solitaire game. And it's easy to learn. It 
takes uh, each round of the game takes about five minutes, maybe 10 or three minutes. It just doesn't take very long. And I would take my son out to lunch and I would play that game with him. And we would just, I would not ask him how his day was, except for hi, you know, being polite and all, but I would just start playing this game. We always carried a a deck of cards with us in the car, whatever car we were using. And we would just start playing. And you know what? It turned off the spotlight for him. And he would tell me about how it was going with his coach in basketball or how it was going with a teacher or if some class was hard for him or easy or if he was having trouble with friends or girlfriends or something. He just opened up because I turned off the spotlight. And I want you to create moments in your life. I want you to move towards being consultants with your kids. And I want you to create those moments that you can seize and have your kid just open up to you. I I want that for you. Another category that you could do is if your kids don't happen to like to play games, do activities. It might be a drive in the car. It could be gardening or shopping in the mall. Maybe it could be going on a hike, could be doing art. It could be one of the things that I always like to talk about is high schoolers and middle schoolers, they love going for boba tea. There's something about boba tea, maybe because it's so sweet and it's not soda or something like that. They love doing that. I would take my kid for boba and just chit chat and not feel like they're being grilled, that they're under a spotlight. And those moments that you create where your child can be with you will open them up in ways that when you have that spotlight in them, you know how they want to almost take a step back from you when it's like, well, how's it going? I was like, no, I don't know, mom. And they give you these one word answers, like, fine, everything's fine. Leave me alone kind of stuff. So you want to create activities that they like doing, even if you don't like doing them that much. Like if you don't really like gardening, but your kid does, I would do some gardening with them. If you don't really like hiking, but your kid does, I would do some hiking. I would do something that they like to do. So Next thing I want to do is I want to talk about what we're communicating to our kids when we have these behaviors that we're doing. First thing, nagging. How do you think someone who's being nagged feels? Maybe your spouse nags you. Maybe your your mom and dad used to nag you. How does that make you feel? What's, What's that thing? Like if I was a kid and my parents were nagging him, nagging me, like I might feel like my parents think I'm stupid. They might, they might tell me that too. They might think that I'm incompetent. They might think that I'm forgetful. They might think that I'll never do anything right. They might, you know, all these things are not very nice things. Like, and I'm internalizing them as a kid. My parents don't think I'm competent. So why should I bother figuring out what I'm supposed to do when they'll nag me and tell me what to do anyway? How about when someone's yelling at you? Have you ever had somebody yell at you? Does it make you want to do the things because that makes sense or because you don't like being yelled at. With our kids, we want them to have their brains on so that they can then make good decisions. And if they're not making good decisions, yelling at them is going to send them into fight and flight mode. So that's like probably not what we wanted either. How about when someone's telling you everything to do? Do this, do that, do this, do that. How do you think a kid feel, feels when they're always being told what to do? Nobody asks them what their opinion are. They just are supposed to do it. You might feel similar to nagging, huh? Like, they don't trust me. They don't think my ideas are worthwhile. Like, it's kind of not very good. How about if someone's chatting to their child? That child is going to feel like mom or dad listened. Mom or dad respected my opinion. Even if I didn't get my way, maybe I... I'm okay. And it was just the situation that's wrong, not me. I'm not a bad person. So when we're communicating, what we communicate to them can communicate confidence, or it could be communicating incompetence. It could be creating that we're um, communicating that we're helpful, or we could be communicating interference in their lives. And I want you to think about that. How do you communicate? Are you interfering maybe a little too much? Are you being helpful? Are you, are you giving your kid confidence? Or are you undermining it? The last thing I want to talk about for how, what about communicating with our kids is I want to talk about when is the best time to communicate? Because I do think that what we say is really important, but I want to say that when we say something to them also is super important. 
when we talk to them, if emotion is involved, if we are yelling or screaming or upset ourselves, or they are yelling at us and, and not doing and emotionally ticked off, they are going to be in fight or flight mode which some of you might already understand about how when we're in fight or flight mode, our amygdala is triggered in our brain and it takes over our prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain that we use to make good decisions. Our executive functions are in that part of our brain. Well, if we're in fight or flight mode, meaning emotion, whether it's it's um, yelling, crying or whatever, it could be happy or sad, you know, sorry, it could be sad or angry. Um, When that's triggered in in our kids, they can't listen. They can't do anything but get over being emotional. So I want you, when emotion is involved, when either yourself or your child is emotionally triggered, I want you to go brain dead. And in brain dead is where you don't react. And you might even do things like say, I know, mom, you just don't understand me. I know. You're so stupid. I can't believe that you said that. I know. And I'm just going to remain calm. And I'm even going to walk away if I have to, because my child yelling and screaming at me isn't getting me anywhere or them anywhere. And I cannot solve whatever the problem is while people are triggered. It just doesn't work that way. Yes, we can keep trying to escalate the issue, but it really doesn't work until things are calmed down. And I don't want to say that our kids should be calling us bad names or rolling their eyes or yelling at us or whatever. I don't want you to let them trigger your wanting them to treat you with respect. I absolutely believe kids should treat you with respect. But if they are disrespecting you, while they are disrespecting you, their brains are triggered and it is not the time to say, you have to treat me better. I'm always, I'm a great mom. I can't believe that you said that to me. It's not the time to say that. We're going to wait until our emotions are dialed down, till everybody's emotions are dialed down. And if it's a little kid, their emotions, you know, maybe in an hour you talk to them. If it's a teenager, it might be the next day. But I would take a moment when things are calm and I would say, you know, it really hurt my feelings yesterday when you called me a really bad mom. I want to talk about that. and. But it's in that moment of calm when I know my, my child's brain is open that I'm going to make headway with them, yelling at them and screaming at them and demanding that they have to give me respect when their brain's triggered is not the time to demand that kind of respect. So when things are up, up in arms and everything, you're going to just dial, dial back. When things do calm down, I want you to ask permission if their brains are open, basically. And I want you to say, oh, I, you know, it's like, it really hurt my feelings or I could tell you were really upset about your friends. Would you like to talk about it now? And ask that question. Are you wanting to talk about it right now? Can we talk about it right now? Ask that question because you know what happens when they say no? It means their brain's still closed and you need to wait until it's open. And you might need to do one of those seize the moment activities, take them out for boba tea or Take them on a hike or something like that, and then bring it up when things are chilled. But if things are all emotional in your house, you just have to try to get them back to calm before you can really tackle the problem. So that's the first skill is going brain dead and not reacting when our kids are upset at us. The second one is I want you to do things where you notice. A lot of our kids think that we don't even listen or care or anything like that. And I want you to just notice simple things. It doesn't have to be big things. And it doesn't have to be, I noticed you got an A on a test. It's more like, I noticed that you parted your hair on a different side. I noticed that you have a man bun now. I noticed that you have your new shirt on. I noticed that you put all your shoes in a line. Just something simple. And I don't want you to nag about it. And when you use I noticed, if they didn't happen to notice, If they didn't even know they parted their hair on the wrong side, I don't want you to make a big deal out of it either. Just like, oh, okay, don't push, just notice. And it just shows that our kids that that we're thinking about them, that we're not asking them to perform every day of the of the week, every minute of every day. Just notice something nice that maybe they I noticed that you were really sweet with your sister. 
The next skill I want to talk about is to be able to set loving limits. And this is a really interesting skill because what we need to do is we need to say what we're willing to do. And I want you to state it in the positive. So I say things like, I allow kids to come to the dinner table who've cleaned up their toys. I read books to kids who are ready at 7.30 p.m. And now notice those two statements have an implication in them that there's something happens when it doesn't happen, meaning let's say books at bedtime. Some, a lot of you have younger kids. And if you don't read books to them at night, they might have a tantrum. But if you deliver the message clearly and with boundaries in a loving manner, instead of like, I'm not reading to you because you didn't get ready for bed in time, sounds completely different than, oh, this is so sad. Yeah, I read books to kids who are ready at 7.30. I'm so sorry. I can't wait till tomorrow night. I love reading books to you. And you probably do love reading books to you. I used to love reading books to my boys. It's such a fun, wonderful, sweet time of the night if you get to that fun, wonderful, sweet time of the night. But if every night your kid is saying, I want some water and they're dragging their feet and they're playing on electronics and doing all this stuff to mess you up and get you mad, it's like, it's just no fun. So we just have a little meeting and we say what it is that takes it takes to get ready for bed. We brush our teeth, we change our pajamas, we um, put away our toys, we finish our homework, whatever it is on that list. The list is posted and you don't have to nag them or remind them. You just say your loving limit. I read books to kids who have, who've gotten themselves ready by 7.30 p.m. With teenagers, it could be, I serve dinner to kids who've taken out the trash. And you're welcome to not take out the trash is what it implies. But if you really are interested in dinner, you might decide to take out the trash. And by the way, I serve dinner from 6.30 to 7. I don't let it be a smorgasbord that lasts all evening. So those limits that you keep positive in your household will, without lectures are what's going to help set boundaries and really communicate with your family about what your boundaries are. Because a lot of the times there's, um, there's angst in our households because our kids just don't know what the real rules are. And the rules keep bending. Like some nights I can go to ready for bed by 7.45 and I still get books. And some nights at 7.30, mom gets mad. And sometimes I don't really have to take out the trash and I still get dinner. And th- it's like, we just have to lovingly, notice I keep using that word lovingly in a positive way, state what the limits are. And it can be really helpful in your households. The next thing I want to teach you about is use choices. When you use choices with your kids, it gives them shared control. And whether you have a preschooler, uh, elementary, high schooler, all of our kids are looking to be able to have more control, aren't they? Whatever the age, they just want some more control. And it's annoying because we don't really want to give them control because we know what we're doing and we can do it way faster. So giving control away is kind of a a bother, right? So what you want to do is you want to give a choice so that the kid isn't cornered into a box because, and what I mean with that is that when you say, get in your car seat now, they're going to have a choice to say, no, I don't want to, or do your homework right now, or take out the trash right now. You're setting yourself up for a battle if they decide the answer is no. Because what do you do when your kid says, no, I don't want to take out the trash. I'm busy doing my homework or I'm on a Zoom call or whatever. They have all sorts of excuses. I'm in the middle of a game right now. So what you do is you use choices and you keep them positive and you say, would you like to take out the trash before dinner or after dinner? Would you like to take out the trash before you start playing electronics or before dinner? Would you like to brush your top teeth first or your bottom teeth first? Would you like to hop to bed or skip to bed? Would you like to slither on your tummy to the car from the park? Or would you like to have a piggyback ride to the car? And notice all of those things like, oh, wow, we activate our kids' brains to think about like, I don't know, this is really interesting. Uh, I really think I want a piggyback ride today. And the whole point here is, is that you aren't cornered into a box either and you only give choices that you like. If you have a bad back, you wouldn't be giving them an option to carry them on a piggyback. If you 
want the trash taken out at a certain time, don't let your kid take it out on Saturday when it needs to be to the curb on Thursdays. So you're not going to give choices that give too wide a swath. Um, my kids, when they were at home in high school, I let them choose which days they wanted to do certain chores. I really didn't care which days they picked as long as they were once a week. There were some, and I let them pick the day and they decided Sunday was going to be their day for their major chores. And that was fine with me. I didn't care if it was Sunday or Friday or whatever. I just wanted them done. And we had a system where if they didn't do their chores, no problem, mom would do it for them. And I would just charge them. I mean, we had an internal system in our household and um, I have a podcast that explains how to do chores in your house if you're interested in hearing some ideas. But the idea here is, is that we give our kids control over things in our house that we don't really need to hold control over. For instance, if your kid is struggling going to bed, you could give them a choice. Would you like to sleep in your bed or on the floor? Do you really care if they sleep on their bed or on the floor? You just really care that they go to sleep. Would you like to sleep with your light on or light off? Would you like to... Um, would you like to get up at seven o'clock in the morning or 7.15? You're just going to give them choices as long as you give them things that, with choices that you like. The last skill I'm going to talk about is that we need to be able to allow our kids to make mistakes. Sounds a little scary, but it can build confidence if you allow them lovingly with empathy. There's a book by Carol Dweck called Mindset. And it talks a lot about a growth mindset where a kid who is allowed to make mistakes and is shown how to overcome those mistakes and uses their own control in their lives to be able to overcome mistakes, they're the resilient kids. Their parents have allowed them with permission and love to be able to like, wow, I can tell that that test was really hard, wasn't it? What do you think you're going to do about it next time? Oh, it's such a bummer. I'm so sorry that you dropped that ice cream. Gosh, it's I love ice cream. That's so sad. I'm not going to run out and fix it for him. I'm going to let him be sad. I'm going to let him figure out how to solve the problem, maybe talk to the ice cream vendor, something like that. But you want to allow them those mistakes because it's also allowing them to understand that life isn't perfect, that life is full of mistakes that we have to learn how to overcome, just like I did yesterday when I sent out the wrong Zoom link to everybody. I've had to work hard to overcome that mistake and I know I can do it, but it's certainly frustrating and, and I'm doing it, you know, right now I'm doing it. So I want you to model that for your kids as well, for yourself. When you make a mistake, say, oh, wow, what, a, what an opportunity for growth. I get to learn how to do something new because that wasn't the right way, was it? Um, and same thing with our kids. We want to love them through, through that. And we don't want to do things like, I told you not to do that. All that, no, I told you so taunting that we do sometimes because we're so mad that like, I told you to put that in your backpack. I told you to put your soccer gear together so that you wouldn't miss any pieces when you went to soccer practice or a soccer game. It's like, we get really mad about that. I don't want you to, I don't want you to own it. I want you to let them own it. So that's the learning part of our presentation. And I want to take us for a little test drive. And what I'm going to do is we're going to go through different scenarios that actually might be happening in your household. A lot of you right now have kids who are on Zoom or some of them are going back to school and homework is an issue. And I want to talk about those skills. We had setting loving limits. We had choices, allowing problems to be solved by our kids, um, going brain dead. I want you to think about what options do you have about when to do homework with your kids? Well, one is choices. Would you like to do your homework before snack or after snack? Would you like to do your homework before dinner or after dinner? Would you like to do your math homework first or your science homework? Would you like to do your art project first or would you like to do math first? Those are all choices and you don't care because what's your goal? To get the homework done, right? How about going brain dead? Especially with older kids, we shouldn't be participating very much in their homework. It's supposed to be their homework, not our homework. So we want to just say, oh, wow, I could tell you have a lot of homework. Oh, math sure is hard. You can meet their emotion with emotion. Allow them to feel that they're being listened to. 
you can give them empathy. That's meeting emotion with emotion too. How about the next thing, when to go to bed? A lot of us fight with our kids about when to go to bed, huh? whether they're old or young. Some kids just don't want to go to the bed. So what options do we have with our these new skills? You can give choices. Would you like in five minutes or 15 minutes? Would you like to go to bed at 8 or 8.30? What does that imply, though? It means that we want them to go to bed by 8.30, right? So we gave them choices. And by golly, if they want to pick eight, they're welcome to. It'll give you another hour of, a half hour of, um, of extra time afterwards. But if they want to pick 8.30, you're okay with that. But you're not going to give them 8.30 as a choice if you don't want them to go to bed at 8.30. Okay, you can also give empathy like, oh yeah, I know, it's hard to go to bed. You were having so much fun with that game or so much fun with that you know, book that you're reading. But just give them empathy. How about waking up? Some of you are having challenges during COVID of getting your kids up because they don't have to race off to school, right? You can give them choices again. Would you like to wake up at 7 or 7.15? Would you like to set your own alarm clock or would you like me to bring in the cat at 7.15? My boys like to have cat wake up. So I'm like, okay, fine. But they they set their own alarm clock most of the time. And I encourage um, high school parents to for sure let their kids wake themselves up Um, because you can give them empathy. I go, wow, I know. Yeah. Zoom starts at eight o'clock or 830 or something like that. Such a bummer to have the teacher on your case because you didn't make it to Zoom class on time. That's so sad. You can also set loving limits. One of my families, um, this is before the pandemic, she had a son, a middle school son who didn't want to wake up, just dragged his butt out. And it's like, he was grumpy as heck. And she decided to give him choices and set loving limits of, I give hot breakfast to boys who come to breakfast by 7 a.m. And she didn't serve hot breakfast if they came later. And her son, by golly, was so motivated by hot breakfast, he got up. And it was no longer an issue about him getting up because he was so motivated by a hot breakfast. So be creative with your choices. Be creative on how to get your kids up, up and out of bed. How about this is always a big a big issue in households right now. I mean, it will be for the next you know infinity years probably. When to get off electronics. The options you can use, you can use choices. Would you like to get off in 15 minutes or half an hour? You can also do things like setting up a digital contract where like we allow kids um, to... Oh, wait, I should say that loving limits is what is the next category um, where you agree as a family that there's a limit of when kids can have electronics. You can set where they're going to be charged. You can set if the Wi-Fi goes off. Do you want the Wi-Fi to go off at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock? Do you want the Wi-Fi to go off at 10 o'clock or midnight for older kids or something like that? But you want to be able to set choices, give and loving limits as much as possible. But I want to say that the best advice that I could give you is that your good communication with your kids is going to get you through parenthood. And what I mean by that is all the little tips and tricks that I was just talking about will help set you up so that you can talk to your kids, that you can bring down the angst and anger and and frustration in your households where you feel like your kids aren't listening to you. If you tweak things a little bit, If you start listening to your kids a little bit more, if you can stop nagging so much and let them own their problems and and love them through their problems, and if you can talk about it while that's happening, if you can have a conversation doing those seize the moment things, you're going to get so far with your kids. And even if you have bumps in the road, you're going to be able to make it through parenthood. And that's the one number one thing that I have noticed with families who even are going through tough times in high school. They can communicate with their kids. They can sit on the couch and have a chat. They can take them out for boba tea and have a chat. And you want to make sure that you have a good working relationship with your kid, that they feel that they're listened to and that they've been given choices and they think that you're fair and that you're thinking that you're pretty fair too. Because there's times where you have to say no, and that's okay. I'm not saying that every choice has to be given. Um, there are going to be some times where we say, you know how I usually give choices? Yeah, this time not. Yeah, curfew is 10 p.m. and that's the way it goes. I'm so sorry. 
And you can be sorry and they can be mad and it's okay for them to have emotions. And you can just let them have emotions. It's okay. And you can help them get over those emotions by being there emotionally for them. So that's the basics of, the, of my presentation. But I want to let you know there's a couple of things that you can have at your disposal that are extra help. The first is I do a podcast now. At the start of COVID, I started doing a parenting podcast. And I have almost 30 podcast episodes right now of all different topics. Um, I listed on this screen a bunch of the topics. Number six is all about tantrums. For those of you who are dealing with tantrums, how do you get your kids to calm down? Um, all the way from little kids to older kids, how to set up um, and deal with. A lot of us give out punishments. And so I wrote a, a podcast and did a podcast on punishments versus consequences. How do you set up good consequences? Anger management for parents is one of my most popular podcasts. It is actually the most popular podcast. And I made it into a, a whole hour long seminar as well. And I have um, topics on how to deal with screen time issues. And one of my most favorite things about helping families have good communication is how to have family meetings to be able to set boundaries as a, as a family. I also have YouTube videos and it's, I have a YouTube channel called Parenting Decoded. Um, all my podcasts can be found on any podcast um, website, like whether it's Apple podcast or Spotify or iHeartRadio or whatever. I have three videos right now on YouTube, uh, one on solving tantrums, um, another on anger management for parents, and then one on communicating with teens, which is this same talk um, with only talking about teen issues. Um, so if you want to have another round of this, you could go listen, you could go watch that video it might be helpful. Um, and then I have a May seminar coming up. It's called Screen Time Battles, How to Win Them. Those two podcasts that I did stem from this particular talk that I do on screen time battles. It sets you up all the way from young kids to older kids. It helps mostly for people who have kids that are eighth grade and younger. But you, um, my husband's going to put in the chat box, he's going to put a link to the sign up. And I will have it in the um, follow-up emails that I'll send to you that you could sign up for this talk. Um, and it's going to be on Zoom again as well. And then you can always email me. I have an email address. Most of you have it now, Mary at parentingwithlogic.com, but I have another one called parentingdecoded.com as well. I have a website that you can go and look at resources. There's a number of different resources there. I have a Facebook group that I would love for any of you to participate in if you're a Facebooker called Parenting Decoded 2021. Um, it's just a fun place for me to um, throw out ideas, for you to throw ideas back at me. An Instagram, if you want to follow me and um, figure out when I'm teaching things, where and things like that. I do a monthly newsletter to keep in touch with people who are wanting to be part of my fans base or whatever. I do teach love and logic classes, but probably not until we go back in person. Um, and then I also have one-on-one -on -one parent coaching that I do with families who want to work on issues just for them, um, that they feel that they need that, that sort of tune-up. And that's the presentation. I'm so glad that we were able to do it together finally today. And I'm going to go off screen sharing right now. And I'm going to go ahead and take whatever questions that you have for me. There, there was one question um, early in the conversation. We can start with that one, I guess. Um, it was from Daryl and it says, how do you tell your kid without coming across as nagging to clean up their room when it's been a mess for days? Okay, well, one thing you can do is you can set a loving limit. You can say something like, I serve dinner to kids who've cleaned up their room. Um, I don't know if you're still online, Daryl. You could, you could um, go off mute and we could have a conversation about it if you wanted. But that's the, that's the challenge is that you basically with setting loving limits, you need to figure out something that your kid needs from you or wants from you. And that is kind of the carrot. And you don't argue about it. You just say, I drive kids to the mall to get presents for their friends who've cleaned their room. The other thing that you can do is you can have a, a meeting with that. If it's just one child that's the offending child, I'd have a one-on-one -on -one with them when things were calm. And I would say, you know, I'm wondering what we can do about getting your room cleaned. What timing do you think is good for that? Is it, would it be possible to clean it once a week? 
would it be possible to clean it once a month? You know, sort of like, what are your tolerations for the room being dirty sometimes? And what are their tolerations? They might say, I don't ever want to clean it. It's like, oh, that's, I could see why that might work for you, but that's not working for me. Um, and to be able to have a conversation about brainstorming ideas, like how about um, we clean it once a month, we have you clean it once a month. And if you're not feeling like cleaning it once a month, then mom's going to clean it and I'll just charge you for it and you can pay me back. And they're going like, what? I don't want to have to pay you for that. I just want you to stay out of my room. It's like, yeah, that's not going to work. So you, have, you basically have to have a situation where you can talk about it is the best thing that you could do is not argue about it, but have a meeting about it. And it could be one-on-one or if your whole set of kids are all being messy, then you can have a family meeting and say like, you know, this is really bothering me. What can we do about that? Does that help, Daryl? Yeah, it does. Thanks so much for the suggestions. As you try something like that, Daryl or anybody else, if you try it and it kind of works, but not quite, feel free to email me and say, Mary, I tried this. Um, I'd really like to clarify it with you. I'd be happy to just do a quick consult with you and, and give you some more hints. Don't feel like you have to, you know, be there waiting it all alone and stuff like that. I, I, it can really help just having someone in your life that you can say, Mary, what's this? It doesn't, doesn't seem reasonable. I think I'm being reasonable. Am I? And sometimes I'll say not really, or, you know, like my mom, (laughs) my sisters and I were just laughing the other day. Um, My mom passed away a number of years ago, but we were, um, her philosophy about our bedrooms as teenagers was close the door. She just closed the door. She's like, that was her philosophy. And she had a lot of kids. So that was a good philosophy for her. And closing the door in this day with uh, electronics, maybe in the room, that's not such a good policy, but I just like that, you know, my mom had, she, she, she figured out that there's more to life than mess. And as long as the mess isn't in the rest of the house, she was willing to compromise with that. And, you know, our, our living room at our house was always completely neat. Nobody could go in there and do anything, but the family room, not so much, you know, it would get cleaned up once a day. So anyway, hope that helps. Any other questions? Mary, I actually have a follow-up. So I tried some of your techniques in real time as you were going through the presentation. So I asked my youngest, he's six years old, uh-huh. would you like to brush your teeth or shower first? Uh-huh. He said, oh, I want to shower first. Okay. Said, All right, so time to get in the shower. It's like, no, later. What's his response? Now, how to respond to that? Well, you just say, well, I read books to kids who are showered. Um, you know, so the thing is, is that like, uh, you, you can give them, your kid's pretty young. So you have a lot of power over them because you are, they love you so much still. Um, and you're not battling for that love any, at that point, probably. You just say, oh, that's such an interesting, that wasn't one of the choices. I guess you're going to shower, you know, showers now. And it's like, yeah. And one of the things that I teach love and logic and, if my kid were to do that to me, it would be an energy drain of like, oh yeah, when I give you a choice and you choose and then you don't do it, that's an energy drain. And, and it's basically where they have to put, it's not a punishment. You give it with love and you say, oh, this is so sad. That really drains my energy. I'm not going to be able to read books tonight. Oh, wow. Yeah. When I get, you know, cause when you get flack like that, doesn't it drain your energy? Like, God. You, you let him choose and then he didn't even want, he doesn't want to do it. It's like, oh yeah, that's so sad. And so um, I could tell you more about that. And in the consequences podcast, we, I talked some about that, but um, feel free to ask me more about it too offline if you need to. Okay. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Other questions? There were not any other questions during um, your chat. presentation. Okay. Any other, anybody else want to jump in and, uh, ask one before you before we end this all right you guys thank you for your patience i really appreciate you all coming tonight and i hope that um i hope that you found things that were really useful to you and um listen to the podcast watch the other um youtube videos and um know that i'm around sign up for my newsletter and you'll know when i teach classes and stuff like that so um anyway thank you so much thank you mary you're so welcome Thank you very much. (laughs) You're welcome. All right. Thanks, Mary. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good night.